morning. Whether you are watching online or have joined us on site, welcome. We are so glad that you are connecting with us today. If you are new at Meadowbrook and are either here or will be joining us in person soon, we have a gift for you. And we'd like to answer any questions you might have about the church. Please head to the hub desk after the service if you would like to connect with us online and keep up to date on what is happening at the church, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. The links will be beneath this video. I have two save the dates for you, Meadowbrook. First, we will be having a child dedication on June 16th. And if you have a child you'd like dedicated, please connect with myself in the office by phone or email. Second, we will be having our annual church barbecue on June 23rd. So save those dates and we'll chat with you soon, Meadowbrook. Good morning. I'm going to ask you to stand. Say hi to someone next to you before we worship this morning. Till I made it. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was not till I
grace, you've shown me grace, you've lifted my shame, and drawn me with loving kindness, washed whiter than snow, and you have redeemed and made me whole. Grace, and you've shown me grace. You've lifted my shame and drawn me with love and kindness, washed whiter than snow. And you have redeemed and made me whole. Jesus, you have won me. You have broken every chain with love. And mercy, you have triumphed over death, and you are worthy of glory and praise. Love, you've shown me love by leaving your throne, by bleeding and dying on a cross. That wonderful cross that took all my sin and gave away. And Jesus, you have won me. You have broken every chain of love and mercy. You have triumphed over death and you are worthy. Glory and praise. So we shout it out and lift up one voice in worship. We sing it out and tell all the earth we can hear it. Jesus is alive and He saves. He rescues and saves. So we Jesus, you have won me, you have broken every chain with love and mercy, you have triumphed over death, and you are worthy of glory and praise. Jesus, you have won me, you have broken every chain with love and mercy, you have triumphed over death, and you are worthy of glory. Sing it out and tell all the earth You can hear it Jesus is alive and He saves He rescues and saves So we shout it out and lift up one voice In worship can hear it. Jesus is alive and He saves. He rescues
Jesus saves At this time we're going to dismiss our children to their respective classes um, the teachers are going to come up to the front here so whoever is leaving go out the side doors let's just pray for our kids <clears throat> God we thank you so much for the blessing that is children um, the future generation of who is going to be leading this church your church God pray that we pray that they can um, just be taught with open minds and open hearts we pray a blessing on the volunteers, the teachers that are looking after them during this time. Pray this in your precious name, in Jesus. Amen. Son of God was laid in dark. 
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is over. Father, we thank you that when we come in here, we can leave the cares of our week and our day at the door and we can come into your presence and the worries melt away and the cares of our, this world, they seem to disappear in the glory of your presence. Father, we thank you for those who are carrying burdens today. God, we ask that you would meet their need according to your riches and glory. Father, that the Holy Spirit would begin to minister to them and just... Uh, even if it's just peace that they need, Lord God, that you would just wash peace over them in Jesus' name. God, thanks for your grace and mercy towards us. Thanks for your kindness extended in the death and resurrection of your Son. That we didn't have to live in darkness, but that we could be set free and walk in the light, Lord Jesus. So God, even in this moment of worship, we give it all to you again, Lord God. Father, if the burdens of our life and the the cares of this world we picked up during the week, God, we just lay them again at your feet, Lord Jesus. And God, we ask you to guide us. You are invited into this place. We ask that your presence be among us today, Lord God. Make yourself known to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated all across this place. And as you do, I'm going to ask Somdi to join me at the front here. And the missions team. As many of you know, Somdi is uh, one of our missionaries to Thailand, and he's actually taking his final trip there this afternoon. And so we're incredibly, uh, we're incredibly honored that we get a chance to pray for you and, uh, and lay hands on you and send you in Jesus' name. And so I just wanted to read a scripture uh, that God laid on my heart for you guys before, before you head out uh, as this, uh, these final moments in Thailand. Uh, it's Psalm 96, verses 2. Uh, it says this, uh, Sing to the Lord and bless his name. 
Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And and my prayer for you is that as you go, as you declare Jesus, that his glory would be made known through your life. Amen. And this isn't the end. And we've talked about that. Uh, This is just the the, the closing of one chapter and the beginning of a new chapter. And so uh, we we do want to lay hands and pray for you as you go, though. Absolutely. Please. (laughs) Without saying something to you, I feel bad. So I would like to, as a God, Jesus loved me. I would like to give my love to all of you in here, in Jesus' name. And the second part is, for the last 10 years, you have been supporting me. And I would like to thank you for all the people that have been supporting me to go for the last 10 years. And we have two churches in Thailand right now. And we have one more than 100 people that come and serving the Lord every Sunday. Thank you for that. Somebody, I would have been shocked if you didn't want to share something. So. <laughs> Let's, uh, would you just re- uh, extend a hand in prayer towards him and the missions team is going to lay hands on him. Father, we thank you so much for your presence on Somdi's life. God, thank you for the effort and the work and the, uh, and the, the prayer and all of the things that he's invested. God, and, and through him that Meadowbrook has invested through, uh, through the generous giving and, and support of him, Lord God. And so we just lift him to you today. God, we ask you to go with him and be with him as he, as he takes this, uh, these final moments with the people of Thailand, Lord God. Father, we pray that you would raise up workers in that field, Lord God, to take over the work that Psalmody has started, Lord God. Father, that it wouldn't, it wouldn't just fade away, but God, that their faith would be stronger than ever because of uh, the, the encouragement that Psalmody brings to them in the next month. God, we thank you for what you want to do, and we just ask in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit would rest upon him, that you would go before him and come behind him, Lord Jesus, and God, that as he goes, Lord God, that you would uh, give him uh, mercy as he travels, God, that the the effects of travel wouldn't linger on his life, Lord God, but God, that as he goes and, and puts his hand to the plow, Lord Jesus, that God, that he would see fruit come from all of his efforts, Lord Jesus. God, thanks for what you want to do, and we just lift him up to you, and we'll continue to pray for him over the month to come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you want to do. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. 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 Bless you. you. Excellent. Well, we're going to take up this morning's tithes and offerings, and um, uh, the ways to give are going to show up on the screen here. That's awesome. And I uh, just encourage you to continue to be faithful in your giving. Uh, this is an interesting morning because uh, it is the installation service of myself. And uh, I've talked to Greg many times about how uncomfortable this makes me. Uh, even though I stand in front of you every week, uh, I'm pointing you to Jesus. And so when the spotlight comes on me, it makes me feel very uncomfortable. So just have lots of grace for me uh, as, as they come and share. Uh, but I want to continue to encourage you to give uh, in those ways that are on the screen there. And, uh, and God will bless you. Amen. Awesome. Greg, would you come? So that we don't make Matt too uncomfortable, at this point in time, I'll ask Josie to join up front, as well as the Board of Elders, whoever is here, and staff. Uh, if you, all of you, can join Trevor, you as well. So we'll, uh, we'll get everybody up here at once, uh, and then we will proceed. As you can see in front, there's a bowl and a towel there. And for most of us, uh, we will remember those symbols as when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And for us as leadership of this church, his church, we want to make that a symbol for each of us as well. We're here to serve and honor him. We're here to serve and honor you. And so as you look at those symbols, please remember that we're here for you. And so this morning, we desire to uh, bless Matt in what, uh, what his future holds here. So I've got a few things I'm going to read. And I will ask Matt to respond, and then there will be a section for us to respond with as well. A pastor's appointment to a lead a church is not only a high calling, but a confirmation and affirmation of God's call upon the pastor. Early on in the process, uh, one of Matt's comments was, he said, I feel God's call on my life to full-time ministry. That was very important for us as leadership to hear. Through a process of discernment, conversation, and a prayer 
in a partnership between Meadowbrook Church and the Holy Spirit, we extended an invitation for Matthew Herman to serve in the office of lead pastor. This isn't a position situated above others in the church, but a position of service to Christ and his bride. The pastor will prayerfully and humbly serve the needs of Middlebrook Church through the searching, teaching, and preaching of God's word, modeling a Christ-like life through the power of the Holy Spirit, guiding the staff in ministry, and leading by example through the ups and downs of life. Since the New Testament times, the Holy Spirit has appointed and anointed Christian leaders to build the church. The Holy Spirit equips, trains, so that through their leadership, believers may grow their faith, lead their families, serve others in love, and share the gospel. The Apostle Paul encouraged early church leaders to stay connected to God and his word, which is the foundation and handbook for every commissional leader, as well as for all believers. Paul writes in Acts 20, verse 32, Now I commit you to God and to the word of the grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So Matt, to express your acceptance of the minister role in our community of faith, you are asked these questions in the presence of those assembled here. Please respond after all questions have been asked. Matt, do you believe that in the call of this congregation and ministry, God himself is calling you to serve as a lead pastor of Meadowbrook Church? Do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you prescribe to the biblical doctrinal standards practiced in the community of believers, rejecting all teaching that stands outside of the word of God? Do you promise to do the work of your office faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and in submission to the governing authorities God has placed in your life? Matt, what is your response? I do with God's help. <laughs> Amen to that. For the rest of us, if I can get everybody to stand at this point in time. To express your affirmation for your new pastor in our community of faith, you're all asked to respond to these questions in positive. Please wait to respond until all questions have been asked. Do you as the congregation of Meadowbrook Church commit to uphold your pastor and church in prayer as often as the Lord brings them to mind? Do you commit to refusing to gossip and judge harshly, but to love and honor your new pastor, who you voted in to lead you? Do you commit to serve, pray, and encourage as you stand shoulder to shoulder in service to God's kingdom with your pastor? Meadowbrook Church, what is your answer? Amen. Thank you very much. Everybody can sit down. At this time, what we would like to do is we would ask Trevor to come forward. Trevor is our executive director of the Ontario Conference of MB Churches. And we would like him to pray. We will lay hands on Matt and Josie. Uh, we know that Matt can't be in this role if Josie isn't standing beside him. So it is so important uh, that we bless both of them at this time. So Trevor, will you pray? Yeah, absolutely. Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who loves us. You are a God who is faithful to us and patient with us, kind towards us. And you are a God who provides for us and leads us. And so, Lord, I thank you that you have led and you have provided for Meadowbrook Church as you've brought uh, Matt and Josie and their kids here to Leamington. Lord, that your Holy Spirit has made it so clear in conversation and in prayer 
that this is the next chapter uh, for the church as Matt enters into his leadership role here. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that's already been experienced. We pray for continued unity among the staff and leadership here. We pray for, for unity across the church, Lord, that this would be a church where people are discovering your call on their lives, where they are encountering you and being filled with your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your gifts in this church and that you would equip this church to glorify you and that you would use Matt's leadership uh, to encourage and cultivate and equip and um, strengthen uh, the church, Lord, that you would build unity through his humility, Lord, that you would promote faithfulness as he carefully teaches your word, Lord, that you would provide encouragement and care as he comes along people, comes alongside people to pray with them and, and hear individual stories and the way that you are working in individual lives. So, Lord, we pray blessing over Matt's ministry here. We pray blessing over the children, over Judah and Kyla and Taya, Lord. We ask, Father, that this move would be a significant step in their faith journey, Lord, as they see their mom and dad taking steps of faith and faithfulness to you. Lord, that they would not be discouraged, that they wouldn't be lonely, that you would provide friends for them here in Leamington, that you would root them in this community, and that above all, Lord, that you would show your presence to each one of them, to each member of this family, Father, that they would know that they are walking in step with you. We pray for uh, Josie and Matt's marriage, Lord. Would you promote unity in their marriage? Help them to honor you by loving one another well. And so, Lord, we pray as well for spiritual protection over this family. We ask that you would protect their thoughts and their hearts and their spirits, that you would guard them by the blood and name of Jesus against every strategy of the enemy. And, Lord, that your light would shine brightly through Meadowbrook Church into this community. We pray that you would promote unity across the churches of Leamington for your glory, Lord, and ask, Lord, that you would bring many into your kingdom. Lord, by your spirit, would you be calling people into relationship with you through Jesus Christ? We pray for freedom over this city. We pray for light over this city. We pray for forgiveness and reconciliation and unity with you. Lord, that the name of Jesus would be lifted up and exalted in Leamington, that you would work powerfully uh, through your church here for Jesus' name's sake. Amen. Well, thank you so much for praying, everybody. Uh, I think Trevor's just going to run and grab his Bible because he's going to be preaching the message this morning. And so uh, we're incredibly thankful to have him with us today. And uh, we just appreciate his leadership uh, over the churches of ONMB. And so uh, would you take a moment just to welcome Trevor as he comes to speak this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's a joy to be here. The last time I was uh, able to come with Ryan Yancey, who's our ministry director for ONMB, and we were able to be with you on a Sunday before Matt uh, came, and it's wonderful to be here for this installation service. Someone caught me in the lobby and asked, is there a warranty once uh, the part's installed? <laughs> and uh, I, I haven't seen that anywhere in any of our fine print. I don't think there's any warranty. Um, so anyway, that was... Uh, it's a, it's a good thing. It's good to be here and mark moments. I, what I find is that we're not actually highlighting an individual here, but we're just highlighting the faithfulness and goodness of God, that he answers prayer, that he leads us forward, that he provides the, the people uh, that he um, has ordained to knit together into the story of an individual church, into the story of the church in a city, all for the glory of Jesus' name. I've been hearing a little bit about Leamington, actually just this past week, was it, that we had Matt just sharing a little bit on a video call for our province, the Ontario Mennonite Brethren, are about 25 churches, two of them here in Leamington with South Point and 
Meadowbrook, and then there's churches uh, as far away as places like Simcoe and Ottawa. So we're sort of scattered throughout the province, and uh, every month we gather together on video for a time of just encouragement and storytelling and prayer among our leaders. And as part of that call this week, we were praying for Meadowbrook, we were praying for Leamington, and hearing some of the good things, the, the blessings here in Leamington, but also seeing some of the stories of uh, brokenness, praying into those places where we want to see God move powerfully. So I'm thinking about homelessness and particularly youth homelessness here in the city, the problem of addiction here in Leamington, uh, apparently issues around sex trafficking. Um, just coming into town last night, I gave myself a bit of a break and drove yesterday from Toronto and so I didn't have to get up too early this morning. And coming into town, I noticed how many are here as migrant workers, the way in which Leamington is connected to the rest of the world through individuals who come and work here on the farms. It's a dynamic and significant place. It's a place of need. It's a place of brokenness. It's a place of opportunity. And we're just praying that God would move powerfully in Leamington, not just in Meadowbrook, but across the church of this city to lift up the name of Jesus as I was praying about before. We're very aware in these days, we just uh, earlier in, in May, at the beginning of May, we came together as pastors and leaders for a retreat. And as we were there, we heard from Derek Parento, who works with Billy Joe. I know you have a strong connection with Billy Joe Isaac and Moose Deer Point here at Meadowbrook. And Derek Parento, who I'm sure you also knew, know, shared a word with us there about not relying on our own strength, not fishing on the side of the boat that uh, is sort of our strength, looking for a harvest out of our ability, and instead to fish on the other side of the boat. So if you read John 21... There's a great story there that kind of presents, it's an historical story of Jesus encountering Peter after his resurrection, but it's also sort of a metaphor for life that we can either be trying to do ministry, catching fish, which was Peter's assignment in our own strength, or we can follow and just obey in humility the guidance of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit and actually accomplish those things that only Jesus can do by his power. And we've been praying and, and actually asking God to open our eyes to the reality of the harvest that can be brought in for the kingdom here in Canada. It's so easy in 2024 to lose faith in the reality of a ready harvest in Canada, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus looked out and said, you can't see it. But their fields are white. They're ready unto harvest. So there's a harvest that Jesus saw and that Jesus wants us to be able to see, to have faith in right now in Canada in 2024. We can talk about our country being post-Christian. We can speak about people being resistant to the gospel. All of these things uh, may actually even be true. And yet, by the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, eyes of people's hearts can be opened. Jesus can draw people to the Father and salvation can occur. And so the fields are white unto harvest. And Jesus has assumed and assigned a role for us. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, he says, you will be my witnesses. So there's a harvest. And then he said to us, if we're disciples this morning, you will be my witnesses right where you are in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So there's a global role for the church as witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus that is our assignment. If we're believers in Christ, we are by Jesus' authority named as his witnesses in this global work. And it's just such a privilege to be able to pray over Samdi and think about the work there in Thailand. And I've referenced the work at Moose Deer Point. This is something that's happening throughout our province and globally as people step into their assignments to be witnesses, to speak with boldness and love and joy about what Jesus has accomplished for us and for all people. We've sung about it so enthusiastically this morning that Jesus is resurrected, that he's alive forever, and we're assigned to be his witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit throughout the world. And he's taught us a prayer as well. He's not just seen a harvest and assigned us a role. He's taught us a prayer saying, your kingdom come, 
your will be done, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. And so we're praying not just for Meadowbrook to be a terrific church, which we want it to be, but we're praying that the kingdom of God would come in Leamington as it is in heaven, that his will would be accomplished. And we recognize that that means freedom for people right now who are being trafficked for sex work right here in Leamington. We know that that means bondage uh, to addiction will be broken in Jesus' name as people step out of drug addiction. We know that people are going to be released from the bondage of homelessness if the kingdom of God comes and is established in Leamington as it is in heaven. So this is an important day to just reflect on how God is faithful to his story. He provides the leadership that the church requires, and he does it for a purpose that the harvest would be brought in, that the people of God would stand as witnesses to his resurrection and his sacrificial atonement, and that the kingdom of God would come on earth as, as it is in heaven. And we've been talking uh, as a church family across the province as ONMB about what it means to really surrender our strength. And so I want to look at some stories from the Old Testament this morning to say, well, if, because as we heard this word from Derek about, you know, don't just fish on the side of the boat of your strength. In, in fact, forsake the seeking to do the work of God's kingdom in your strength and instead follow the direction of Jesus into the assignment that he is giving you to do, relying on his power in order to bring in the harvest. And some of our pastors have said, well, what does that actually mean? What does that look like practically? How do I do that work within my mind and heart of turning away from my own strength and instead relying on the strength of God? That can be challenging. We actually have abilities and gifts. We have resources, financial resources, material resources, gifts that God's given us in our churches. And it's just so easy to tip towards relying on our own strength rather than actually taking that posture of relying on God. And so I want to suggest uh, some things this morning that come from Old Testament stories, kind of strange encounters between God and his people that might help us. They're not the definitive answer. They're not necessarily the whole answer. They're pretty simple, straightforward kinds of things. But they're helpful in terms of taking those steps to say, I don't want to rely on my own strength. Teach me, Lord, in my heart, how do I rely on your strength in the ministry that you've given me to do? The first one comes from Joshua chapter 5. And these are all just sort of moments in the Old Testament that stand out to me as sort of surprising. And this one uh, certainly does, Joshua chapter 5. So this is just before the conquest of Jericho. You can uh, perhaps situate yourself as you remember that story. The people of God have come across the Jordan uh, God has, again, supernaturally stopped the flow of that river. And so just as they went through the Red Sea or their parents went through the Red Sea uh, on dry ground, this generation has moved across the Jordan as the water has been stopped by God. They've set up a memorial there, and they've actually circumcised all the males uh, of a certain age because they want to demonstrate, we're going to be your people, God. Uh, and they're now being led to begin this work of claiming the land and conquering the land that God had promised to them. And it says in verse 13 of Joshua 5, When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua approached him and asked, Are you for us or our enemies? Neither, he replied. I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in homage and asked him, What does my Lord want to say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Remove your sand the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did that. This is a surprising encounter for me. For one, I mean, this is a physical manifestation of a heaven, heavenly being, the commander of the Lord's army, and Joshua is able to see him there. This doesn't very often happen in Scripture at all, and yet this is a very sacred and important moment in Joshua's life. 
And Joshua, naturally, this is just before they're going to move as God's people against the city of Jericho. Joshua, as a commander of God's people, is on high alert. He's trying to think through, you know, where are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And he comes across someone. He doesn't know who this individual is. And he asks a very natural question. This person's sword is drawn. There's some sort of risk and danger here. And Joshua says to him, are you for us or for our enemies? Now, just pause there for a moment. We know that this is the commander of the Lord's army. And how has God worked for Joshua and his people? Now, Joshua is one of the few who came with Moses and Aaron out of Egypt in the very first deliverance that occurred for these people. There were 10 plagues demonstrating God's power in Egypt. The Red Sea parted, as I mentioned, and these people came through on dry ground only to see Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. These are people who have been led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. These are people who have seen the presence of God at Mount Horeb shaking the mountain and smoke billowing up. These are people who have received the law from God and been directed about how to live as his people. They've been provided with manna uh, and quail so that They can have food to eat. They've seen water come from a rock. They've had deliverance against armies that have come against them already by this time. And so you would think that when the commander of the Lord's army encounters Joshua, the one who is succeeding after Moses as God's agent to lead the people, and that man, Joshua, asks the commander of the Lord's army, who are you for? Are you for the people of Jericho? these idol worshipers, these ones who are against you, or are you for us as God's people? We would expect, would we not, that the commander of the Lord's army would say, Joshua, I'm for you. I'm with you. I'm I'm a representative of the army of God who's delivered you from Egypt, the God who's provided for you in the wilderness, the God who parted the Jordan or stopped the waters of the Jordan so that you could pass through. I'm on your side, Joshua. And yet, Arrestingly, in verse 14 of Joshua 5, we read that this man, this angel, this angelic being says to Joshua, neither. I'm not for you, and I'm not for your enemy. I am the commander of the Lord's army. What's he doing here? Is this to say that somehow in this moment, heaven had taken a step back from Joshua and the people of God and said, well, you know, we're going to wait and see and see what these people do. We're not sure if we're going to actually continue to to be faithful to them. No, that's not what's happening here. I believe that there's a rebuke here in verse 14 of Joshua's way of thinking. You're asking the wrong question, Joshua. It's not whether we or I, as the commander of the Lord's army, are on your side. That's the wrong question. The question is, are you surrendered to be on God's side? You've misunderstood the relationship here. It's not that I am going to submit to your leadership, Joshua. You're going to submit to mine. You have to be on God's side. It's so easy for us. It would be so easy for Meadowbrook as a church to sort of sort out what you believe God's wanting you to do and think about the ministries that might develop in the future or those ones that you want to continue to be faithful in that God's already assigned and that basically you would say okay we've got it all sorted out we have a vision we have an idea of where we want to go and now we just want to ask God to join us and empower us and strengthen us that he would be sort of an add-on bolted to your purposes and plans to turbo boost them to strengthen them to propel them forward it's so easy to do Because you have an assignment from God that's good. You say, well, all we want to do is see people come to Jesus. Excuse me. We want to see people come to Jesus. We want to see people delivered and set free. We want to see marriages restored. We want to see children cared for. We know all the things that we want to do are good. And so all that we want to do is sort out how we want to be about it. And then we want to ask God to bless those plans. And the commander of the Lord's army would say to that kind of thinking, you've got your thinking wrong. It's not that God will come and join your purposes. It's always that you are constantly and forever submitting yourself to the plans and purposes of God. 
Which is not at all to say that for a moment God's always changing his plans and you always have to be wondering about, well, what, what is it now, Lord? Do we have some different kind of direction? It always has to do with a heart posture that you would never stand in pride and say, boy, God is so lucky to have us on his side. God is so blessed to have a church like ours here in Leamington. Things are firing on all cylinders. This is wonderful. But always instead that you are submitted to the purposes and plans of God. It's interesting, just after this, Joshua is given a crazy assignment about how to defeat the city of Jericho, right? He's given direction by God about walking around this city and, and continually having this sort of worship and prayer service for days on end in order to defeat a walled city. And if he hadn't had this interaction with the commander of the Lord's army to understand it's not about us being on your side, Joshua. It's about you being on our side. Couldn't it have been that Joshua would say, no, Lord, you know, that, that's not, we have a lot of fighting People here, we can go forward. All you need to do is help us. It's interesting, and I'll just say quickly here with limited time that, you know, when he says, what does my Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, want to say to this to his servant? He just says, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. Very interesting. The assignment for this commander of, of uh, the people of God is simply to worship and pray the Lord already has his purposes and plans sorted. The provision of God is secured. God doesn't need our help. He needs us to submit to him, to be dependent on him. Another striking story uh, for me in the Old Testament comes much later in the story of the people of God with the story of King Josiah. King Josiah is king over Judah right at the end of the nation. The Babylon is about to come in and conquer Judah within a short number of years. I'm not sure how many. But Josiah uh, becomes king at eight years old. His, all the kings sort of leading up to Josiah are wicked and evil idol-worshiping kings over the nation of Israel, and sadly, the kings that follow after Josiah, even his own son, are not faithful to God, and they return to idol worship, but Josiah stands out. He becomes king at eight years old, and the word of God says that he was, uh, in verse 2 of 2 Kings 22, he said, it says, Josiah did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in all the ways of his ancestor David. He did not turn to the right or to the left. He's this beacon of faithfulness to God right at the end of the nation of Israel before they are conquered and taken into captivity in Babylon. And when he's about 26 years old, uh, some years into his reign as king, the 18th year of his reign, Josiah... Uh, begins to oversee a project to restore the temple in Jerusalem. And while that's occurring, they find a, a copy of the law. It says in verse 8 of 2 Kings 22, the high priest Helkiah told the court secretary Shaphan, I have found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. And he gave the book to Shaphan who read it. And they read this book to Josiah, 26-year-old young king, surrounded by evil, and he, he's read uh, the book of the law that God gave to Moses. It's interesting. This has to be found. It's kind of like they're looking through the attic, and they come across, you know, something of value, something significant. They blow the dust off this copy of the law, and they read it, and you get this sense that the nation is not familiar with these commands. They have so long ago strayed from God's plan and purposes for their nation, they don't even know what God said to Moses. But when Josiah hears this law, it cuts him to the heart. He tears his clothes. And it says that he uh, seeks God in that moment. And listen to what the Lord says to him in verse 16 of 2 Kings 22. This is what the Lord says. 
I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read, because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the work of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. Now again, let's put ourselves in the middle of this story. Josiah became king at eight years old. He's been king for 18 years. He decides at about age 26 that it's time to kind of renovate the temple. We should should clean this place up. And so he assigns some uh, strategy to do that work. A copy of the law is discovered. The law is read to him. He realizes the nation is far away from obedience to the law. They are steeped up to their neck and practically drowning in idolatry. And he is brokenhearted over this, and he uh, wants to hear from God, and God says to him, judgment is coming against this nation, and it, he says, my wrath will not be quenched. What's God saying? Josiah, you have to understand, this nation is damaged spiritually beyond repair, and nothing is going to stop My judgment against this nation, Babylon is coming. This nation is going to be taken into captivity. Now, you're a 26-year-old king. What are you going to do? Would you just sort of say, well, I guess that's it then. There's nothing we can do. God's made it very clear. The nation is going to be taken into captivity. There's nothing that we can do. Chapter 23 of 2 Kings Verse 1 says this, So the king sent messengers, and they gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. Then the king went to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as well as the priests and the prophets, all the people, from the youngest to the oldest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the Lord's temple. And next the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, his his decrees, his statutes, with all his heart and with all his soul, and to carry out the words of the covenant that were written in this book, and all the people agreed to the covenant. I want you to understand the drama of what Josiah is doing here. He's uncovered the the law of God. He understands that the nation has not been faithful, that they have strayed deeply into idolatry. He's cut to the heart. He hears from God that destruction is coming against Israel. They will be taken into captivity in Babylon. And his response is to gather all the elders of the people. And it says all the people of Jerusalem. And to read this law over them and stand before them and say, I am making a covenant that I am going to be devoted to this law with all my heart and with all of my soul. What's Josiah saying? I don't care. That it's not going to have a demonstrable impact in God's purposes and plans. I accept that our unfaithfulness to God has been sufficient. That judgment is coming. But in my lifetime, with my energy and with my time, we will follow God. We will be devoted to the Lord. It is so easy for us as leaders and for us as churches to begin with a good motive to say we want to be a church dedicated to God. We want to be a church of prayer. We want to be a church of faithfulness to the gospel. We want to be a a church of ministry to the least and the last and the lost in our city. And we will do that so that something dramatic will happen. Just imagine what will occur if we're faithful to God, if we do great things, if we're truly pure of heart, then something dramatic will occur. This church might be twice as large or three times as large or four times as large. We might be planting churches all over this region. And that's not a bad thing to hope for or believe about. But you can understand how something happens in a human heart when we make our faithfulness to God conditional on some sort of dramatic result of a story that we get to be the heroes of in the future. That's a very different kind of arrangement to make with God than the one that King Josiah is making here. 26-year-old young man. 
over the nation saying, I understand and I accept that the future of this nation in God's sovereignty is not good. And I'm not trying to make that statement over the nation of Canada. We are not in that moment. We are not Israel. This is not the time when Babylon is coming in. But I just am intrigued by this leader's heart that he hears this message that God is going to bring judgment and it does not dissuade him one bit from giving all of his energy and all of his leadership capacity to bring the nation back into faithfulness to God. What could motivate this? Nothing except that God is worth worshiping, right? There is no motive. There's no payoff. He's not going to have a legacy. No one's going to put a plaque and say, here is a plaque to King Josiah who turned the nation. We wouldn't be all this prosperous country if it weren't for King Josiah who turned us back to God. That's not going to be his legacy. In fact, his own child who succeeds him as king reverses everything that Josiah has done. And they go back into idolatry. But Josiah's legacy stands and shines in the pages of Scripture who's, as one who said, even there, though there will be no payoff, God is worth my faithfulness. God is worth my obedience. God is worth the whole of my effort. And I think in Canada, in North America, as someone who's been involved in pastoral ministry for many years, I'm tired of stories that are about strategies for our success. And I believe it's too often that we are sold some sort of economy that if we just do what God wants us to do or we strategize the right way, that we will get to be a part and heroes in some great story. I just think there's something insidious and prideful that comes into our hearts in those moments that we say, yes, Lord, of course I want to be a pastor. Of course I want to lead in your church. Of course I want to serve because it's the most exciting story that I could possibly be a part of. What about just the fact that we say, Lord, I don't know what you are going to do, and you don't owe me anything, but in my heart, I want to honor you and worship you and love you and be faithful to you. The problem that happens is that when churches and leaders believe that they've kind of come across some sort of spiritual technology that if they just take a few steps, something dramatic is going to happen, that when they take those few steps and there isn't a breakthrough, they say, oh, well, I guess I got it wrong. And too often we're forsaking the very things that God is calling us to persevere in because we're not satisfied with the results. We need the heart of Josiah in our churches to pursue God no matter what. And I'm just intrigued and delighted by his heart. There's something about him forsaking his strength in that moment, too, and just saying, Lord, I just want my life to be for your glory. The last thing that I want to point to comes actually a little bit earlier than that Josiah story uh, in the early ministry and call of the prophet Isaiah. And this is a famous passage, Isaiah chapter 6. And he tells us in verse 1 that in the year that King Uzziah, or Ahaziah, as you read about him in in, uh, 2 Kings, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on, on a high and lofty throne. And the hem of his robe filled the temple. So Isaiah's in the temple and he gets a vision of God. And it's God is high and exalted on his throne. And there's a the the hem of his robe is coming down. Into earth and filling up the temple where Isaiah is. Seraphim were standing above him and each had six wings. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And the foundation of the doorways shook at the sound of their voices. And the temple was filled with smoke. Now the reason this this story sort of stands out to me is that we... Imagine what it would be like to see the glory of God the way that Isaiah is seeing it here. And we imagine what our reaction would be. We say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I would see you. I want to know you and your power and your glory and your holiness. That would be the height and joy of my life to see you as you truly are. And Isaiah gets this vision of God and his reaction is to say, woe is me. 
Now, this is the Christian Standard Bible. Woe is me, for I am ruined. The King James, for I am undone. I am taken apart. Because I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. It's almost like he's saying, he is saying, I'm not worthy to have this vision. This is going to take me apart. This is going to undo me. I'm going to be destroyed because I am actually able to see the glory and holiness and majesty of God. Verse 6 of Isaiah 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his right hand was a glowing coal that he had taken out of the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Now now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity is removed, and your sin is atoned for. And from that, Isaiah is given his assignment to be God's mouthpiece to the nation of Israel. Again, at the same time, he's a contemporary of King Josiah. He's given an assignment at a very difficult time. But what's significant to me about this story is, first of all, as I've already said, as he gets a vision of God, his sin is exposed. He understands, like he never has before, the greatness of his need spiritually. How the the holiness of God is so great that he is able to see his sin like he never has before. It's interesting that this man, who's so eloquent... And you can read the the book of his prophecies and see how God chose him as a man who's anointed with power to speak beautifully. And the way in which he feels his sin is to say, I am among a people of unclean lips. My mouth is even sinful. The very best skill that I have, Isaiah's probably most outstanding ability, if you read this book, is his ability to talk to communicate, to speak authoritatively. And in the very area of his strength, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He sees his sin like he never has before. And in that moment, just in an instant, one of the seraphim brings this hot coal and touches his lips, and this word, your sin is atoned for. It's dealt with. If there's any one way in which we can learn what it means to not rely on our own strength, but instead rely on God's strength. It's this vision of the greatness of our own sin. I believe that God needs to and graciously does expose to us the depth of our sin. Not just the acts that we have done that we can easily list and say, oh yeah, I know those things were wrong, but actually the intention, sometimes even behind our good action, God by His grace exposes to us and says, that was actually sinful because everybody thought you were doing well, but you were actually trying to draw attention to yourself. So sin infects our motives, not just our actions, our attitudes, our reactions, When we're sinned against, how do we respond? Sometimes very much in that moment, we see our sin. And when we see the greatness of our sin, when we see the significance of how our thoughts, our motives, our actions, our words, our attitudes, all of these things can be affected and infected in a way that is offensive to God. That's a moment when we know we have to forsake our own strength. When we know that it's not going to be about our abilities and our capacities and our strategies. And what's even more significant is not just to recognize our sin, but to recognize that in an instant God can respond to our sinfulness and say, don't worry, your sin is atoned for. Not because a hot coal touches your lips in a vision, but because the Son of God willingly came and died in your place I love the thought about how Jesus lived, that Jesus lived for something like 33 years. And I love to just recount this and encourage myself with the recognition that Jesus never once had a thought that offended God. He never once had an emotional reaction that, affected, that uh, offended his father. He never said anything that was out of line with the perfect will of God. He never did anything that was nothing that wasn't a delight to his father and Jesus took that perfect life every second every instant from beginning to end and he offered that sacrifice on the cross for us his perfect unblemished delightful record 
of faithfulness to the Father offered in our place so that my blemished record, which is blemished in ways that I can't even understand or comprehend, is totally dealt with, is wiped clean and dealt with at the, at the cross by the obedience of Jesus. And Jesus' perfect life was given completely right into death. It wasn't just that he became a man and lived as we do, but that he bled unto the point of death at the cross. He fully gave his life for us. And because of his obedience, he was raised by the power of God to live forever. And we've been singing about that. That Jesus' life is inextinguishable. He has been resurrected and he has life to give who, to all who would come to him. When we recognize the reality of the gospel, we are in a moment where we will not rely on our own strength, but we will instead depend on the strength of God, the God who loved us, who sent his son to save us, who has the life for the whole world to pour out on us and through us that streams of living water would well up inside of us, that we would have the life of God to give to others. I pray. I pray for the sake of Jesus' name that Meadowbrook is a church that forsakes your own strength and relies on the strength of God. I pray that you would be a church that doesn't ask God to join your plans and purposes but surrenders yourselves to the plans and purposes of God. I pray that you would be a church that in your heart would be willing, would have that heart attitude that would say, Lord, even if you didn't give us success, even if we didn't see a powerful move of your spirit, your name is worth it. We will be faithful to you to the end. We will dedicate ourselves to obedience with all our heart and with all our strength and with all our minds. That you would be a church that recognizes the greatness of what God has done for you. That you would recognize your own inadequacy and the mercy of God so that you would forsake your own strength and cling to Jesus and say, Lord, as you saved us at the cross and by the power of your resurrection, apply those benefits to the others who are still lost and entrapped in this city that they too would know forgiveness, that they too would know reconciliation with God, that they too would know the power of the resurrection. I want to ask uh, the band to come forward uh, or the worship team to come forward as we just close here. I want to offer a word of prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you have plans and purposes for your people here in the city of Leamington. Lord, may Meadowbrook be marked above all as a church that forsakes anything that is of themselves, anything that is of their own strength, anything that is of their own plans, anything that is for their own glory, and clings to you in humility, Lord. Would you bless them with the knowledge and the persistent witness of your Holy Spirit that it is not about you joining their good plans, but them surrendering themselves wholeheartedly to your plans, for their church together, for their city, for their marriages, for their families, for their individual lives, Lord. I pray that you would release the people of this church from seeking to come up with their own solutions, Lord. That you would give them wholly into the freedom of trusting the solutions and strategies that only you can conceive and the work that only you can accomplish. Lord, I pray that you would give them the hard attitude that even if they do not see success, they will follow you. They will worship you. They will pray to you. They will plead heaven over this city. Lord, of course we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be faithful to your promise to build your church and defeat the gates of hell. But Lord, I pray for a purity of motive here at Meadowbrook, that it would be for your glory and not for the success of this church or any individual. And Lord, I pray that this would be a church that would recognize the beauty of the gospel, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Lord, that this would be a church that lifts up not anything about themselves, but points people to you, Lord Jesus, as the one who willingly came, lived perfectly, 
died, says a substitute, and was risen as King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, keep our eyes on you. Lord, may we be people who say, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. Guide us. Lead on, O King, Lord Jesus. Exalt your name, we pray. Amen. Just as we sing this final song, I want to invite the prayer team to come forward and uh, encourage you, if you would appreciate an opportunity to be prayed for, that you also would join and and have that prayer uh, before you leave, before you go home and get on with uh, the rest of your day and your week, that you would seek God in prayer. ask you to stand as we close in worship this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. My life laid down, surrendered now, I give you everything.
of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made of, I time this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence. God, thanks that it doesn't have to stay in this room, but it goes with us when we leave. And so, God, I just pray that you would invade our hearts and our lives all week long. God, that that you would help us uh, make those decisions to serve you when it seems uh, difficult or inconvenient. God, that you'd be with us and you guide us along, uh, along our week this week, Lord Jesus. God, thanks for your grace and mercy extended towards us, and we ask you to come uh, and be a part of our lives every single day. God, not that we would, uh, you would fit into our plans, but that we would fit into yours, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Trust that you're encouraged by uh, the word today, and that as you leave, uh, you would uh, encourage somebody as you go as well. God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.